Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. We've got four episodes in this unique podcast series, and it's all thank you to our sponsors, Gulfstream. Really, really appreciated Gulfstream. Excellent aircraft. Thank you so much. The legendary G650 and G650ER continue to redefine travel with proven class-leading efficiency and high-speed performance. Fly farther, faster than on any other business aircraft. Saving more than 50 hours a year cruising at Mach.90. Access destinations that matter the most through excellent takeoff and landing performance combined with exceptional range. Relax in the smoothest ride in business aviation. Soaring above turbulence that other aircraft must pass through and enjoy higher fuel efficiency and lower CO2 emissions than the competition thanks to an advanced wing design and engine technology. For over 60 years, Gulfstream has set the standard for performance, safety and support. gentlemen, friends, colleagues, listeners, here we are, the fourth and the final phase of our show, the episodes, all built around one more orbit. And quite fittingly and expectedly, we've got Colonel Terry Verts, who was an integral part of the entire organization. And what I would say is an incredible artist of film, because what you managed to do with this particular subject matter, Terry, was absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for having me on. It's, I wish I was there in person, but uh, it's good to be here via Zoom from Houston. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's great. And again, I've got to say, apart from the T-shirt, which is lovely, <laughs> you've probably got one of the most impressive backdrops that we've ever had on any of our uh, podcasts. Amazing. <laughs> thank you, yeah. I'm sure we'll get a little special tour of, of everything that's there. So fantastic. Sounds now, what good. I'd like to start with is um, you managed to put together something so special. And um, I, as we were talking before, before we went on, on air, um, it's very difficult <laughs> to put some spirit and some character and some fun and some highs and lows into a subject matter that on paper would look as if, well, it's a group of people flying around the world. <laughs> But that, you did, you honestly, you did something so good with that film. I loved it. I watched it from start to finish several times. Now, how did you come to put all the characters together? So a little bit like your Brenner and the Magnificent Seven, you've <laughs> managed to create the Orbit 8. So how did you come to put those people together? I like that term, the Orbit 8. Um, so thanks for asking that question. That's, that is exactly the, the difficulty that I had as director. Originally, when my friend Hamish had this idea to, to fly around the earth and set a world record, um, I was gonna be one of the pilots. And that the, it drug on, drug on, didn't happen. Finally, when it was gonna happen, there was no time for that. So he said, well, can you make a movie? Which is exactly what I wanna do. I'm trying to move into film and TV. and. I sat down with a friend of mine. I, I do guest lecturing at the USC Film School the, in Los Angeles, the Southern California Film School. And, uh, the, and I teach the IMAX course because when I was in space, I helped make an IMAX movie. And so the professor that I do that with and I sat down one Sunday afternoon, we got a big yellow legal paper out and we said, okay, here's you know eight white guys flying around in a business jet. How are you gonna make a good story out of that? And we started to outline, you know, what do we really wanna say? And the thing I came to realize as a director, first of all, everything's about story. You can have these amazing, beautiful yeah. images, but if there's no story, if there's no characters, then that there's no movie. So we tried to have, and we didn't have talent. I was the talent. <laughs> I actually asked George Clooney if he did it. He, would, he wanted to do it, but he was busy filming a movie. We, I tried to ask a couple other guys in Hollywood, because it's a cool project. 
but it was only in a few weeks. Like this whole thing happened in just a few weeks, not months or years. Yeah. So we, we sat down to outline it and any good science fiction movie has aliens and lasers and spaceships, but that's not what it's about. It, you know, at the end of the day, it's about much deeper societal issues or conflict, you know, US, USSR was the Star Trek time frame yep. or whatever. Yep. So I, the, the big meaning of this movie was how exploration can bring people together. So Apollo was during the Cold War, but kind of the world came together. And then this mission, we had eight people from eight different countries and we worked together. So that was, that was how the story began. That's the orbit. Hey, like you said about a story, I, I remember some, somebody telling me that whatever you do in business or whatever you do, if you can get a story that people can relate to, then it's easier for them to follow it. And if, what you mentioned there about the Cold War, you know, when all those crazy times and things were going on, the space program with Kennedy that actually <coughs> brought nations and it brought the whole world together when eventually a man landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking speaking with your colleague, uh, Cosmonaut uh, Jamadi, um, it was amazing that in such times, such harmonization, collaboration could be formed up in space mm -hmm. and it wasn't able to be attained in the same levels back down on Earth. It was amazing. It, and it's still that way. And by the way, I love Gennady. He, I thought he was a star of the film. He, he's a funny guy. He looks like this very serious Soviet fighter pilot. And when we did our crew photos for Expedition 43, when I was commander, he was on my crew. I was like, all right, guys, everybody smile for this one. And he's sitting there like, I'm like, Gennady, smile. He's like, I am smiling, you know? But when you talk to him, he's the funniest guy. And the my favorite scene in the movie, I think, is when we're all sitting there and we realized that Hamish is British and I were on the Western side and Ben is East German and Gennady was flying um, Su-24s in East Germany. And here we were flying this mission together. So it was a great example of, you know, former enemies working together. Yeah, and he does. He's, he's got an incredible smile. We, we, we had a he session does. with him and with Anna who, who did the translation. Right. Uh, there, was a, there was a few misses but it was a great exercise. But the one thing that I said to him was his skin and his age. It looks as though those years that he was up in space have done something because he's almost like a, a Dorian Gray character. He's not aged. In fact, he's got better. <laughs> he, he's, he's in great shape. And, you know, it's funny. One of the chapters in my new book, I wrote a chapter about time travel because we're going so fast. And with the acceleration that we have, we actually, because of relativity, because of Einstein, we actually aged less. And during my seven month mission, I aged seven milliseconds less than you did down here on earth. So that's something I like to joke about. Yeah, but at that seven milliseconds, because myself and, and, and Gennady, we're roughly the same age. Right. He, definitely, he definitely looked better than me. So I think I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to get myself up into space as quick as possible. You know, yeah. And I, when I, 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 I know some actors and actresses and the actresses are like, oh my God, I need to go to space because you know for them time is for everybody time is important for them time is really important so they they always yeah. want to do that and uh yeah gennady gennady has the most time speaking of time yeah in yeah space well, of anybody yep yep 800 879 days yeah 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 incredible and we, we mentioned that which is which is absolutely amazing now another thing and i've got to say to you personally i was lucky enough in 2014 to be invited on the IATA World, well, the IATA World Cargo Symposium, which was in mm -hmm. California. And we actually went to CSC, the California Science Center, mm -hmm. and we had dinner in there with the Endeavor in there. And it was amazing. And I can remember sitting there talking to the guys around and saying, do you, re you know, do you realize where we are and what this means and all this sort of stuff? We had such a great conversation that would never have happened under normal circumstances, but I never thought I'd ever meet somebody who actually landed it back on yeah. earth that must have been an amazing experience incredible it was i tell you as a, as a fighter pilot and a test pilot it was the highlight of my aviation career the space shuttle was the most amazing flying vehicle ever made we're never going to make anything like it again it was just really cool the new capsules that we have you know the boeing and spacex and and even the soyuz they're great but they're 100 percent automated the, you literally you just sit there and don't do anything at all and then all of a sudden you're docked and uh, the shuttle was not like that at all. You had to fly it manually. So as a pilot, I was really lucky. I knew how fortunate I was to get the chance to fly it. 
uh, and on the second to last uh, mission. I've got a, I've got a model up there, but anyway, it was it was awesome. And and uh, something else that that made me think and put things together is yesterday I was watching the two last seven four sevens of British Airways fly off, you know, being retired out of the fleet, mm, which uh -huh. is about three and a half years earlier than expected because of the financial the situation. COVID, right. But to see the Endeavour on top of a 747 being flown yes, around yeah. New York and then, you know, then, then, you know, and then going up through the roads in California. I mean, it's incredible. It was the way, yeah, they, they, the Toyota Tundra was the big commercial. They got to drive it through Los Angeles. They had to take down, all the street lights and yeah. telephone poles and, you know, just so it would fit through the street. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I'm actually good friends with Alex Cruz, the CEO of, of British Airways and a guy named Al Bridger is their chief pilot. And um, so I got to fly the British Airways Boeing 747 simulator not too long ago there in London. And um, it's sad that, that it's getting retired, but the, you know, 2020 happened and th things yeah. are changing. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I see the old queen of the skies flying off. It's, uh, you know, it makes you realize, you know, A, getting old, how time is changing and, you know, great memories, but uh, we'll see what's coming. Now, your, yeah. your book, before we go heavy into the um, One Last Orbit, your book, How to Astronaut. Okay? Yes. Firstly, it's, it's a little bit, it's a, it sounds a little bit more difficult um, than how to, yeah, exactly. But how, how to cook, how to cook a good steak, or how to cook, or whatever. But I understand that you've done it in such a way that you want it to be nice and easy for everybody to appreciate and have some fun and laugh along with. Yeah. with it. So those short essays that you've got in there, what what sort of storylines do they cover? Well, um, I wanted to write a, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to write a book that would bring. Uh, space travel to everybody. So I didn't want to write another astronaut memoir. There's a million of those out there. Um, so I, I broke space flight down into 51 short essays. You can read them in any order. They're really for anybody. I use a lot of acronyms because NASA is all about acronyms and I make fun of them. You know, yeah. like I'll say, and then I was working on the ARED, which is the NASA acronym for workout machine or then the SRBs came off, which is the NASA acronym for big rocket or whatever. So I, I, I take these technical terms and hopefully make them accessible and fun. Some of the chapters are what you'd expect. How do you launch in a space shuttle? How do you deal with emergencies? How do you do medical training? And then some of them are what you probably wouldn't expect. Like, uh, what do you do if your crewmate dies? What do you do with their body? Or how do you time travel? Or are there aliens? And so there's it's like stuff you'd expect, stuff you wouldn't expect. Um, I, I wrote a chapter about space tourism because that's the new thing. And so there's, you know, if you're going to be a space tourist, here's the stuff you need to know. Um, there's a chapter about sex in space. And so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's something for everybody in there. I feel, yeah, I feel we should, uh, we should stop at that one. Um, sex in space. I don't mean stop and not include it. It's something that would interest me hugely, but maybe, maybe for another podcast. <laughs> let's let's do it <laughs> yeah i mean that would be a, very speak. Different, a different a di yeah, not you and me yeah yeah that would go down well wouldn't it hey, we'd get we'd have a bestseller there um <laughs> right, i think whilst we just take a little a little breather there now the 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 record all right so you guys must be so close <coughs> as a group after achieving that and yeah. um, you know, obviously, we've seen the emotions. We've seen the emotions when uh, when it was announced and when you all finished, which was incredible. And especially Yannicka, um, uh -huh. I, I asked her about her statement where she said, "Is this mission so important to me that I'm happy to risk my life?" And she said, "Because I'm such an, uh, a tech nerd, yes, it is." Right. And uh, we had a session with her. She actually got she actually got a little bit emotional. She had such a a life experience, I think, as a, as a part of that whole exercise. It was brilliant. But for all eight of you, I would imagine for the rest of your lives, you'll be having reunions and get togethers because yeah. it's such an incredible thing that happened. It is. And, you know, we still, we text each other on our group chat and the circumnavigators is what we call it. And, um, but we got to change it to the orbit eight. I like that. But yeah. we, you know, we just met. I mean, I knew Yannicka and I knew Hamish, but the group didn't know each other until the week that we did this. And so we all kind of descended on Florida. We got to meet. We had a, dinner beforehand just to get to know each other and then we went through this thing and then on Friday night 
we had another group dinner and it was like, we were best friends for life. You know, some of the guys brought their wives there um, and we were toasting and, and it was like, can you believe we just met each other a week ago? It was amazing how this thing brought us together, which again was the point of the movie, how exploration brings people together. You know, there's a story of the, the lady in Mauritius that yeah. was not planned. I, as a director, there's a great Steve Jobs quote. And he said from Apple, he said, I don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. Yeah. I hire smart people so they can tell me what to do. And so my, my philosophy as director, well, first of all, I'm a new guy and I had some of the most experienced cinematographers in the world helping me. I said, look guys, this is what I wanna do. Here's the story we wanna tell. You guys go get the stuff. And the lady in Mauritius was not planned. The guy in, um, in Chile was yeah. our fixer. He was like the guy that was just supposed to make stuff happen. And he was so good, they filmed him and you know that was a great story. Um, the guy who went to Kazakhstan got Gennady on film. And so all this stuff wasn't necessarily planned, but these, I, I, I let them do what they do and they did a great job. And by the way, there's another interesting story here. We were really short on gas, as you know, that was- Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Especially over the North Pole, but especially over the South Pole. That was a really long way to fly over an entire continent on one tank of gas. Yeah. And uh, so originally we were gonna have James Nyhouse on the airplane and film the whole thing. He was my director of photography. And the morning of it was like, and you saw the the weight limit. We yep. were having to weigh everything. The bags on the scales. We, that, we did that for real. And we had 69 pounds of margin. And so it was like, hey James, sorry man, you can't fly. And so I don't feel sorry for him because he got to fly in the F-104 and he filmed us from the chase airplane. But on the leg from Kazakhstan to Mauritius, we had enough weight because we didn't need all a full tank of gas. So I called up my photographer in Kazakhstan the morning we were taking off. And I said, hey, Dan, when we land, film us and make sure you have your passport in your back pocket and then just walk on the airplane with Gennady. And so that's what he did. He literally, with a few hours notice, he, he just walked on the airplane with his camera and some spare batteries and a passport. And he filmed us for 12 hours. And then we put him on a plane and flew him back, back home after that. And, we, and Bill Bennett did the same thing in Chile. He just came on the airplane when he was done with the gas pit stop and flew back to Florida with us. <laughs> Incredible. And did, yeah. did they get a mention in the Guinness Book of Records? I, that's a good question. They should. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the book yet. I need to look at it. Page one, four, five. Well, there you go. I, I need to, I need to order a copy of that book. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yet. I, I would imagine, I would imagine you all have to sign one for each of you. It'd be an incredible keepsake. Yes. Absolutely amazing. Right. So now you've got the storyline, you've decided what you want to do. Now as a director, how did you, how did you decide the messages that you wanted to give? throughout that film because as, as you said from some of the from some of the fuel stops you know to see the 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 fuel are running with the hose and being part yeah. of the whole exercise you know and people people all helping out and the speed that they were doing things that was incredible right and the live feeds with the with the children in the schools and right. you could see their eyes and their minds just opening up with such a wonderful experience and then you see what it meant to all of the individuals and also we were we we were told that magdalena not just from from you know looking after you all from the catering and making sure everything else was okay but she was actually the the, the medical go-to person god yeah. forbid if something had gone wrong and how prepared right. she was in case you had to touch down in the south pole because uh, it wouldn't have been taken off again right so having all of those storylines and and also and also the um you know the the climate issue, the carbon underground, how logical you made that. That made me understand so much more and so much easier. So how did you map all of that out as, as a new director? That was tough. Well, like I said, we sat down, Matt Scott and I, I've got, I still have the yellow notepad where we just started writing stuff out. But the story is really how my brain works. I'm not, I'm not like just a one thing kind of guy. I like to have multiple layers and I guess it's ADD. I, I like a lot of different things at the same time. So on the, the outer layer is, it's about setting a world record. We're, uh, there's these crazy people in this airplane and we're gonna fly around the earth on the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Yep. Um, and that was cool because we were taking off and landing at the Kennedy Space Center. I had to get permission from, my former buddy is now the boss at the Kennedy Space Center. So we had to get that worked out. 
but the there was a couple other layers. Like I said, we're these international people coming from different countries. So there were really 10 different nationalities on the airplane, including the photographers. Um, everybody was from a different country. And then the ground team was probably from 20 more because it was a Qatar Airways airplane. Yeah. yeah. So the, and our headquarters was in the Middle East. Yeah. So we had, I had crews in five continents filming this thing in a 48 hour period. It was crazy, the logistics of getting this thing coordinated. Um, and it's a Middle Eastern airline. So there was people from all over the Middle East and India, and it was, it was really an international team. And then there was the Apollo space angle. Like what's it like being in orbit on a space station versus what's it like being in orbit on an airplane? And that was getting those graphics done was so complicated the, to visualize the, the space station orbit versus the airplane corkscrew orbit. That was, believe it or not, that was a really tough scene to get. Um, and then- It was good though, uh, it, the way it explained it, it I, yeah. I thought it was fantastic. I, it, a astronauts, I showed that to astronauts and I'm like, wow, I never thought of that before. So yeah, yeah that was really cool technical thing. Um, and then we had to live stream this mission, which was not originally part of it. And that's complicated when you're flying on normal routes, there's lots of bandwidth and you can get Wi-Fi on an airplane. But when you go over to the North and South Pole, there's not because the, the satellites are over the equator, they're not over the poles. And so that was a really complicated thing that, that Janneke had to do. She actually borrowed a very famous person's G650 on, at an airport in London that everybody listening to this knows. And so that we could do some technical testing before we tried all these crazy uh, pieces of equipment. Ironically, the, the boxes, the electronic boxes that she used were called Apollo. Um, and then underneath all those layers, there was the, um, you know, there's the friendship, there's the space, there's people come together, but then there was the environment, like you mentioned. Um, yeah. This organization called the Carbon Underground, we worked with them to make our flight carbon negative. Yeah. Um, and they, they have this really unique, they don't just plant trees, they actually work with the soil and change soil management. And um, according to their data, it's 30 times more effective than just planting trees. And so that yeah. by working with the biomes and the small microbes that are in soil, as a way to bring carbon underground. That's their name, the carbon underground. So there, there was a lot of different layers to the story. No, that was, that was, that was incredible. Now, if, and like I said, you can, well, I could imagine now a film being made of the Orbit 8, okay? <laughs> and then it's what types of characters would play which, because some of you, I mean, you're like, you got Hamish, who, who seems to be a real, I mean, he, he seems to be a man who just wants to keep doing things with his he's an adventurer, yes. Taking Buzz yes. Aldrin, you know, yes. his son, the, the first Nigerian to get down to the South Pole. I mean, so many firsts. It's incredible. And he still yeah. wants to do more. He, he wants to go down to the bottom of the ocean yeah. now. He, yeah. he is a British explorer, you know, just an adventurer for sure. And this was his idea. And it's a crazy idea. When he first told me, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that would be great. Sure. Like, I didn't think it was going to happen. And he made it happen, which is amazing. He's also he gets stuff done. <laughs> so, if, you know, stuff that you wouldn't think is going to happen, Hamish will get it done. So he was an amazing character. I'll tell you what, Magdalena was probably the most interesting person on our flight. Um, she's Polish, but yeah. everybody was from a different country. And she is like, we have this beer commercial in America, the most interesting man in the world. Well, Magdalena is the most interesting woman in the world because she's, she's just amazing. Um, Janneke, was a, on the Norwegian uh, Olympic skating, you know, development team. She was a speed skater and then she became a filmmaker. And so she's amazing. Ben Ruger, the German is like the funniest guy. He, he, he and I want to do a TV show now because we had, there was a lot of chemistry there and it was really cool. So we just had this, the pilots were really cool. Everybody was, initially I was afraid because we didn't have talent. You know, there was no Hollywood actor or actress that was going to be our star. But it was a really great group of people. There was definitely personality there. You should do that with Ben. I, I, I worked for Lufthansa for nearly 30 years and I didn't, I didn't see that many comedians in Germany. So if he, <laughs> if he can make you laugh, that's a definite winner. <laughs> Have you seen the heaven and hell joke? Like, the, and they make fun of Europeans, you know, like heaven is where, and they had like the police are, yeah, the yeah. cooks are, the parties cooks are. are from yeah. England. The, the, the comedians are never from Germany in that joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in heaven, but in hell, yes. Same as same as the chefs or the cooks. They're right. All from England in hell, yeah. 
<laughs> no, 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 uh, that's great. But uh, it, it would be, a, I tell you, it'd be a great film because of all the other things that went on behind the scenes as right. they were all then brought together, you know? It's a, maybe that's what you can do next, Terry. Well, that would be fun. There was there was a lot of stories too that I couldn't tell. And, you know, when as we were talking to different networks and how are we going to distribute this, they're all like, they wanted to see more danger. They wanted to see more crazy stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. but this is a Qatar Airways airplane that you know we can't. It's not we can't show this crazy dangerous thing because obviously they're flying very safely. So um, there was limit. There was lots and lots of limitations on what we could show in the film. Yeah, but you added that there was a certain amount of reality whereby people could see that you know, God forbid, if something happens. Right. And, and there, there had to be an emergency landing. Well, you've got to say goodbye to the aircraft because it's not going yeah. to take off again. Right. And also, you know, the, the fact that there was very limited, if any, alternates over a certain part. And then you flew over the volcano. Then you got the I Russian didn't even know that. And, until we landed, I didn't know that there had been a volcano down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then you got the Russian aerospace and then you got the fuel yeah. issue. You got yeah. the freezing temperatures going above the you oh, know the God. max limits. You yeah. Know? So there was it was minus eighty three. There. There's yeah. a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff that happened, and there was even more stuff. The landing um, in South America it, in uh, Tierra yeah, del Fuego. Low, yeah, weather conditions. The weather was not good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the winter time in South America. It's not in in Antarctica. It's not good weather, <laughs> to say yeah. the least. But a lot, I mean, a lot of credit also, like like in any of these issues, it has to go to the aircraft, the, the G650. Yeah. What an incredible aircraft, huh? It's unbelievable. I think it's the best business jet in the world. I mean, we it, it's just an amazing airplane. And we set, I think, 13 or 14 world records. Um, it's set all kinds of world records. It can go far. It can go fast. It's a pretty good-sized cabin. It's comfortable. Now, it's comfortable for like a normal leg, but we lived in, we had the big crew plus filming, plus all this equipment for 48 hours. So that's not how you're normally gonna use a jet like that. Um, but we did it and and it's an amazing airplane. I don't think this record is gonna be beaten, maybe never, not not for a long time. Um, yeah. It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be hard to beat what we did. Yeah, we were talking about that. And even with, you know, new generation aircraft, the likelihood of the, the, the balance that the 650's got as well, Right. It's going to be very, very difficult. So it's going to be very tough. Yeah. Yeah. And it was also also interesting that it was Qatar. I, I also worked for Qatar Airways. So oh, I wow. had experience with the chief. And uh he definitely he definitely put safety, 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 oh, safety, yeah. safety first. Mr. Al Backer. Yeah, 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 yeah. He 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 wouldn't take the risk, I don't think, of of something not being successful. Having that, if, if we had not had Qatar Airways, this thing would not have happened. Because it wasn't just the airplane. Hamish had several wealthy individuals offering up their G650, but they didn't have this massive logistical support. Qatar sent two captains to yes, each of yes. those fuel. You can see it in the film. Yeah. To, to yeah. make sure. And the day before, they all did a dry run of the refueling. Because the flying, the flying is the flying. You're going to fly at that speed. The yep. route is the route. You're not going to make up a lot of time unless the winds change. The time and the threat and the record was set on the ground in the pit stops. Um, and that's where Qatar was so strong. And they had this mission planning. There's a whole section about going over there and, and doing the mission planning. And um, they, you know, this would not have, the record would not have happened without them. And the chief was willing to do it. And there's not a lot of CEOs that would be willing to take this risk because it was a risk. It wasn't a guaranteed thing by any stretch. So Mr. Al Backer was, uh, was definitely like the foundation of the whole project, but he's funny. He's this um, very strong leader to say the least. And so it, he and I were doing a press conference afterwards and <laughs> someone said, Mr. Al Backer, were you, uh, were you nervous? And he looked at him and he said, I don't get nervous. I make other people nervous. It was so funny, and we it just is, laughed so hard because it's yeah, true. But that's so true, though. That's so it's true. It's so true. You know, <laughs> he's got a reputation, but he certainly lives up to it. But fair play to him for doing that and supporting such a absolutely. Such a project. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a great. Without his support, this thing would never have happened. Yeah, and also the backup with the IOC and all the guys behind the scenes. You can see that in the film. But for anybody that's worked there and knows what goes on, it's amazing. Yeah, it was. Real, it was. It was. It was an operation. 
Yeah, right now, I feel, I feel that we've got to have a little tour of your backdrop. All right. So ah, I, yes. made a, I made a stupid comment asking you, was that an American football helmet behind you <laughs> over your left shoulder? Um, but that was only because I played a little bit of American football and I was wondering whether you did as well. But now I know. So if you want to talk us through the two helmets that are there. Sure. I played, I was a lineman. What position did you play? I, pl I actually, I played, and anybody who knows, they'll say, they'll say, yeah, he was just played the pretty boy parts, you know. I did a little bit of cornerback and safety, but I was a kicker. Oh, wow. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's an important thing. <laughs> it is. All right, it so is. let's talk about this. Okay, right. I'm not sure what you can see there. So yeah, over no, there, the old, my, so there's your F-16. My F-16. I was a fighter pilot beforehand. That was my F-16. Uh, helmet there. I've got my textbooks from Harvard Business School. Um, there's my NASA helmet. When I was at NASA, we flew T-38s. Um, I've got my, uh, this right here is a picture of the space shuttle Columbia. I was a family escort for that mission, SCS-107. So I took that picture the night before launch, and that was the one that was lost. Um, Terrible, huh? There's our G650 from... Uh, yep from uh, One More Orbit, signed, oh, the whole signed. crew signed yep. it, which is pretty yep. cool. Yep. Um, and then I've got my, just some other space paraphernalia, some pictures up there from One More Orbit. I've got my new book, Ooh. How to Astronaut, some of the IMAX film that I helped make. So yep. that's, my, uh, that's my background. So what we should do now probably is just let everybody know about the documentary film and that it's now available on a number of streaming platforms including iTunes, Amazon, and the Google Play Shop. But also for more information, this particular video will give a link to everything. And I've also found out that there's um, a DVD with extra yes. 10 minutes extra, um, which I'm definitely gonna buy. I'm gonna buy for, for, for my nephew, Liam, because he's, he's mad on flying. He wants to be a pilot, probably wants to be an astronaut. So I hope he watches this as well. Now, what I'd like to ask you is, you all the things you've done, okay have been incredible and my god there's only a few people that will ever do anything similar so when you and the guys get together you must be on such a level i can't even imagine and when you look behind you at the things that you've got on your cabinet and i think of what i've got on mine i'm thinking oh my god what a boring <laughs> old bugger do you know what i mean but i'm still proud of those achievements so when you did the the one more orbit what was the most rewarding <coughs> feeling that you had or reason why it was so rewarded you know the for me it's seeing people's reaction to the film um we did a screening in qatar uh, a few months ago before covid yeah. um and it was the, the it was to see the movie on a big theater for as a director was really a thrill for me but um everybody was so happy afterwards like people had smiles on it and they were genuinely wow, that was great. Like they were surprised that this was a really cool movie. Um, and that meant a lot to me because it was, you know, you can be polite and this is nice. So that was great, you know, but I could tell that people were genuinely excited about it. So for me, seeing that was, was really nice. And I went to the, uh, like I said, I do guest lecturing at the USC film school, um, which they consider the top film school in the world. The NFTS, the, the one in Britain would probably say differently, but, um, they, uh, I screened it for students and we didn't even tell them I was there. So they just yep. like came in and watched this thing and they were excited about it. So just seeing people, I think people are surprised at first. It's like, Oh, they're not expecting that much. And um, to see the happiness and this world is so full of like, Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. So my, I think my tweet this week is going to be, Hey, is everybody looking forward to the, uh, another inspiring and motivational presidential debate? Yeah. Um, yeah. Me, me neither watch my movie instead you'll be a lot happier you know i'm going to tweet something along those lines <laughs> i think you should because um <laughs> what you said there about there's so much negative press negative issues this damn virus is a terrible thing you yeah. need positivity you know people right. need to plan positives and i would say to people wherever you are whatever you're feeling whatever your problems are stay away from more negative people because they just drag you down and ah, that's that can, a great, great advice. Yeah. Yeah. But, but seriously, anything, anything that can motivate you, inspire you or make you feel good. And I'm not saying it just because I watched the film because I would have done this anyhow, but I watched the film and it is a feel good film. 
it's a really nice, genuine film. It's lovely. And um, thank you so much. So many, I'm so for happy. So many reasons. It's also educational. It also gives people the opportunity to do things they never thought they could. And and when we were when we were talking as well with with Yannicka and finding out about her medical past and the you know the the hurdles mm. she had to overcome, it, yeah. it's incredible. So yeah. if you are ever going to do the Orbit Eight film, you've got so many sub stories that could come together with a common denominator of breaking a world record. With all those characters, it was incredible. I, honestly, I take my hat off to you. You pick you painted such a wonderful wonderful picture of human mankind and their endeavors to do something and test themselves. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. The, Yannicka's story is amazing. She was in a wheelchair after a horse yeah. riding accident and she, and she <laughs> didn't accept that. And she ended up, you know, training with the Norwegian ice, uh, speed skating team for the Olympics. So yeah, her story is, uh, her story is unbelievable. Yeah, she's such a character. I, it'd have to be something very, really serious for, to go up against her. I was, I was really yeah. by a bundle of energy. <laughs> yes, she's trying to start a company now to do, to do clean energy. It, it's yeah, she she doesn't think small. That's for sure. Yeah, no, no, it's brilliant. So, so that was one of the most. Brilliant. What was the funniest moment of the whole of the eight exercise? <laughs> well, that was when after we went over Antarctica and froze the airplane. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It, so it got cold. It was minus 83 Celsius, which is yeah. cold, colder than the airplane's supposed to fly at. And for a long time, we had to fly across the whole continent. It wasn't just a real quick minus 83. So um, anyway, when we landed there, there's a scene in the film that where Ben was our engineer and he got the toilet line froze and he got dripped on. And oh my God, he smelled so bad. Like I literally had to take ibuprofen after he was in there and he had, he washed himself up three times, I think. And, and he just stunk. And I was, I, I was, it was killing my head. I had to take some ibuprofen. So we had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet. I'll bet. I'll bet. And you'll never forget that one. Yeah. No, I, I, for I, sure. I remember that in there as well. And, and what was the most surprising thing that, that, you know, that either you all experienced or you personally, what, what was it that, you know, that, that will that will live with you now for for however. For me, so I've seen the whole planet. I've seen most of the planet. And I want to do a show where I go visit these extreme places that I saw. That's one of my one of my goals. Um, but I had never been over the North or South Pole. I've been to the South Pole, but I've never been over the North Pole. And uh, it's beautiful. It is a crazy place. The ice patterns. There's some video in the film. We, you know, we yeah. filmed it. Um, it's really unlike anywhere else on the planet it looks from i i always say from space from the airplane it looked really amazing but it was a lot of water and not a lot of ice and you can see that and so that really stuck that's what and that's what motivated the carbon underground segment yeah. it's like that's an amazing north pole but there's no ice there it's all water and so um it, that's not entirely true but that really stood out to me yeah and yannicka was telling us that while you were flying over there was there was two people who were doing. Um, they were they, they, they were they were trying to navigate to the North Pole, right? But they were having problems because what they were on was floating backwards. So they're almost going as far forward and then back again. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know, it it's real. It's something we need to fix. Um, uh, and so that's that's why we made part of the movie about climate change. Yeah, but it was. I, I thought it was incredible, and especially coming coming from people that had actually been in space mm -hmm. for, for mul multiple reasons and then looking back where they came from and, and seeing that it was injured and that it was hurting and that it needed to be fixed. But the film made it so obvious that it's not beyond us to fix it and to fix it quickly. Right, so I love Larry Copald had a, has a line in the movie and, uh, and we're talking at the end and I'm like, so Larry, so there's hope. And he says, oh my gosh, yeah. we're, gro we're literally growing hope. And I love that. Like that's his thing. We're growing hope. Um, and I, the the climate can be so negative, and people get so angry, and they are yelling, and that's not the way you change hearts and minds. No. No. You don't change hearts and minds by yelling at someone, telling them how stupid they are. You you change hearts and minds by saying we're literally growing hope. And that was that was Larry's message. He did, by the way, right after this, they his organization did a deal with the whole 
country of Thailand with the government to change the way they do farming, which is which is pretty cool. No, it's amazing. And like you said, it's it if you can entertain and tell people a story, it stays a lot longer than somebody shouting or pointing a finger and right. telling you what you should or shouldn't do, because that just goes boom straight over the head. Right. And then they get defensive and that's not what you want to do. And so anyway, that was that was an important part of the film. Yeah. So let me ask you now, you got you got several books there. What do you read to help you learn something new? Um, I'm reading a book, a friend of mine named Katie Mack is an astrophysicist and she wrote a book called The End of Everything. It's about the end of the universe. And so I'm reading that right now, uh, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it's like about cosmology and the Big Bang and it's just really cool, you know, physics stuff. Um, there's another book called Sapiens by Yoav Noah, I think is his name. Uh, it's an international bestseller. You know, a lot, of, it came out a few years ago. Uh, Bill Gates recommended it. So I'm reading through that. Um, as part of this book tour with How to Astronaut, I've gotten to meet a bunch of authors. Um, and so I've gotten some fiction books. I've got a couple here by Sylvain Nouvelle. He's got a, he's got a few um, fiction books out and a, a couple other uh, science fiction authors. So normally I don't read fiction, but I'm going to start reading it because I'd like to write it. Uh, you yeah. know, I have some stories that I want to do. Um, I'm working with a a Hollywood screenwriter on a comedy. I want to do a space station comedy, kind of like the Simpsons in space or friends in space or something like that. So Ben, um, ben will be getting a starring role in that, will he? Ben, I, I want to base it on the whole crew. I mean, we need a, we need the proper British co commander and the Ben and the, the, you know, Magdalena is like this international spy, you know, like yeah. she would be a perfect character on that. So, um, but he's got a really great story too. That's, that's not, it's a, it's a geopolitical thriller kind of James Bond kind of story. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're working on that. So I, I like to read a lot of different stuff, but I think it's important to read. Um, and when, as we're going through these political debates and stuff, I wish they would ask each other, Hey, what's the, what's the most, the best book you've read or what's the most recent book you've read? Cause um, I think that's an important skill that a lot of, that may be a lost art sometimes. It is, yeah. Also, a little bit about the type of person as well, from what you read. Right, right. So I won't, I won't tell anybody what I'm reading at the moment because it, <laughs> it might not reflect well. <laughs> so, what film would you like to make next? Um, that is a great question. I, I, I have about ten or twelve. I have a, a production slate of different projects that I want to do. The 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 TV series that I really want to do would be Extreme Earth, where I get to go visit people who live yeah. in these extreme places that I saw from space. Um, the, the film that I'd like to make is actually this TV series with my with my colleague, who's a screenwriter. Um, I think it's going to be a great show. I've we just started pitching it this week, literally to a few people, but um, I think that's going to be a good one. I'd like to make a movie about uh, Colombia. The 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 accident that happened that would be a, a very personal human yeah. story um uh so those are some those are some ideas that i've got so you're gonna you're gonna be kept busy i'm pretty sure and what's the family think of uh, everything that you've done well there it's funny so here's what my family thinks well i was sitting with my daughter 10 years ago by the way let me let me backtrack Yannicka and I made a short film called Cosmic Perspective a couple months ago. We had to enter it in a film festival. And I should have said this right away. It's about space photography and how it's changed our perceptions of the, ourselves and the universe. And I would love to turn that into a feature length, like an IMAX type of film yeah. or a docu-series where you just interview really cool and interesting people like Brian Cox, for example, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when you saw these Rover pictures, what did you think? And I think it would be a really cool series. So that's something. Uh, this weekend, we're going to finish the final draft and it's going to get pitched next week. Um, so anyway, yeah. Okay. So we're excited about that. No, 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 that's, that's awesome. So your next, so we're, we're, we're talking about the family. What did the family think of you? We're talking about your daughter. So right after my space shuttle flight, I fly on Endeavour. I'm sitting there with my daughter. She's, I don't know, 10 years old or something. We're on the, on the couch watching basketball. I like sports. 
And um, this was back when LeBron went to the Heat and he, the Heat, he was going to, he had just won his first uh, championship. So we're watching the, the NBA finals and she looks at me and she said, dad, why can't you be more like LeBron James? <laughs> Yeah, there's a man who just come back and landed safely from, from space. She's like fighter, pilot, astronaut, whatever. Why can't you be more like LeBron James? And I was like, well, there's one or two obvious things, you know. He's he's from Ohio and I'm from Maryland, so clearly that's a big uh, difference. <laughs> anyway, it just made me laugh. The kids are not impressed. I, I think as a, now that they're older yeah. and they see the things that I've done, and I, they're, I think every once in a while they're like, oh, wow, that's that's a good thing. Yeah. But uh, you know, kid, kids are never going to be impressed by dads. I, I was having lunch with Jim Cameron a few months ago and um, we were talking and he was like, he has a teenager and he said, Terry, my, he, and he was on his way to film Avatar. It's in New Zealand, you know, this multi-billion dollar deal he's got to make three new Avatar movies. And he said, Terry, my son was so like, he doesn't care about anything I'm doing. He was just so excited that I was getting to meet an astronaut. And, uh, <laughs> and my kids are like, whatever. Where's LeBron, you know? So it's just funny. The kids of people who do stuff like that are never impressed. They, they're always more interested in the other, the other dads. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. But, but every now and again, <laughs> every now and again, they look up and they, they, they're, they're very pleased. And I'm sure they're very pleased with what you've done. I would be absolutely proud as punch. And it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And we're wishing, and we're, I, I'm pretty confident that the film will be a huge success. It's going to go crazy. And for anybody who wants to feel good about something in this crazy world where we've got something that's affecting the whole world so negatively, it's a wonderful, wonderful storyline. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish you great success in everything you do. I hope to meet you one day because it would just, it would just, it would just sort the whole loop out. Having dinner underneath... The endeavor and then meeting a man who flew it would be it would make my day well i'd love to do that <clears throat> I, I i used to get to the uk pretty often until COVID hit so hopefully i'll be back soon and um uh <laughs> funny story the last time i was there i was on good morning britain i think with piers morgan yeah oh, okay. yannick actually went yannick went with me himself to himself so I was going on this show and we walk into the green room before the show and Yannicka's eyes get this big and she's like, oh my God. I was like, what are you talking about? And she walked out and she whispers, that's Nigel Farage. So I'm like, who's Nigel Farage? I had no idea. And, and, we're, <laughs> and then he goes on, he comes off and I go on and all they wanted to talk about was flat earth. And I was like, oh my God, I came all the way to London and you're just talking about the flat earth. Uh, anyway, that was my last, my most recent British press experience was Nigel Farage and Flat Earth. So hopefully we'll do it this in person. It'll be something different. It will be a lot. It'll be a lot different. It'll be a lot different. <laughs> it'll be a great pleasure. Really, really, honest to God. Inspirational, lovely film, easy to watch, happy to watch, entertaining, learning. Everything about it was superb. Well done. Thank you so much. Well done. And I'm sure whatever you do next will be a huge success as well. And uh, please let us know what it is so we can watch or read. And I'm definitely going to get the How to Astronaut. I'm definitely going to buy a, buy a copy of that. Amazing. Well, I'm looking. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me on. This has been great. It's a pleasure, really. Thank you.